Hi everybody, and welcome to this episode with the Anxious Resistance. Now today I'm going to be talking about something that's very important to me. Many of you may have seen already my video about my story and that six part video series that I did explaining the years of struggle that I had with anxiety and depression. And there's, there's some crucial details that I don't always mention in those videos. I try to make them applicable to everyone. But in this video, I'm gonna talk about something very specific and I'm gonna be talking about my religion as a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And particularly, I wanna to talk to missionaries today because in my story, I talk about coming home early from a mission. And for members of the faith, uh, that can be a very difficult thing to come home early because it's often very public and many people see what happens. Um, they know you come home and sometimes they might assume it's for a bad thing and uh, like that you got sent home and they don't always know that, hey, you were out there struggling with mental health or even other physical difficulties. And I wanna talk about my experience with that. So in 2012, I put my mission papers in and received a call to the Oklahoma, Oklahoma City mission. And I'll admit I was maybe a little disappointed at first to be called to a stateside mission, but I came around to the idea and thought Oklahoma was really gonna be great. Later in 2012, I had a relapse on my anxiety, which I hadn't had issues with since I was a junior in high school. So it had been a couple of years. In the month before I was gonna leave on my mission, it, it hit so hard. And I was very much questioning uh, what I was supposed to do, what I was gonna do. Kept feeling inspired to continue on to to go on the mission even though I was having such such difficulties and I did I, I went and I entered the MTC in December of 2012 and really struggled while I was there and actually this is the first time in my uh, my life that I experienced real depression many people uh, may know this because they've experienced it but Anxiety, if it goes on for long enough, kind of leads to depression because your body just can't handle that state of excitement and that state of um, fear. Uh, it's really the, the fight or flight mode and you're in it constantly, but your body can't handle that for very long and you end up getting depressed because your body just is worn out completely. You know, you're your serotonin in your brain is all used up. And that hit me in the MTC. I just, I got so tired. I got so kind of, kind of miserable feeling. And I, I wasn't really sure what I was supposed to do, what I was gonna do. I wanted to stick this out, but I made it about two weeks before I kind of panicked a little bit and was like, I can't, I can't handle this. And you know, this is while I'm still close to home in Provo. I end up kind of freaking out and calling home and saying, hey, come come pick me up. I, I can't do this. And the people in the MTC agreed that, you know, this probably wasn't a good time for me to be there. And so I returned home and that was a difficult experience for me, especially since it, it really wasn't very long, just a couple of weeks. You know, a lot of people knew I was home. It's like your friends, your family, everybody is expecting you to be gone for two years and then all of a sudden you're back. I tried to be very upfront and open with them that, hey, I, I'm home because of this, because of this anxiety and the depression that I wasn't even recognizing yet at the time. But luckily for me, people were good and they were supportive. And I've often found that to be my experience when you're open about struggles with mental health, um, that you find so many people that struggle with the same things that you had no clue before because um, everyone kind of feels like they have to be closeted about it. But over the next year uh, after I got home, I started work on that anxiety. I was back in therapy, very consistent therapy every week with a psychologist. Um, I also started seeing a, a doctor and 
started medications and all this stuff, uh, which I talk about more in, in my story. And after having returned home, I asked myself the question, well, why did the Lord inspire me to go? Why did I feel like I should go, even though I'm having such a hard time? And the answer to that, that question and that prayer came to me when I watched uh, a Mormon message, a video that I'll, I'll link here. It was by Elder Holland, and he had taken his son out. They were out, out in the Arizona Strip, just kind of in the back country wilderness, just enjoying a day out in nature. They were coming home, and it was dark. They came to a fork in the road, and he didn't know which way they should go. And he and his son both prayed and asked which direction they should go. And they both felt it was a certain way, and they went that way, and the road came to a dead end fairly quickly. They turned around and took the other road. And I wondered why the Lord impressed them to go that way. The answer came to Elder Holland that maybe the easiest way to really answer their question was to send them down that short, dead-end road, and that way they knew for sure, definitely, that the other road was the right road, and that was the way to go. And I think in my case, that was also true. I went on that mission and came home after two weeks, and while I was there, found you know, resources. And what I needed to, to truly get help, starting to see the doctor, starting to see psychologists consistently, which helped me get better. And that was the answer to my prayer. But after about a year, I feel like, okay, I can, I can do this again. I was kind of slid back into a normalcy and, you know, felt good and comfortable and thought, hey, maybe, maybe I can give this another go. And I did, so in, at the end of 2013, it was almost exactly a year later, I entered the Provo mission. And I entered the Provo mission that December uh, because it was, it was like a trial mission. They call them 12-weekers in the Provo mission, or at least they did when I was there. What it was is, is if I did okay for these 12 weeks, these, these two transfers, then they would send me to my assigned mission. And since Provo's close to home, you know, it, it was easy if there were issues or, or problems to get me home. And I remember my parents dropped me off at the mission home in Provo, and that was, that was kind of my goodbye. It wasn't like an MTC drop off this time. They just, they just left me at the mission home and, and took off. Um, and I remember that night, my first night in the mission home, all, all the new missionaries for that transfer got there later that evening. I remember just kind of freaking out because I'm like, I don't know any of these people. I don't, I don't know my mission president. I don't know what the heck this is going to be like. And just like a return of all those prior fears uh, that I had the original time when I was in the MTC. And I remember going to my mission president that first night and saying, hey, I, I'm struggling already. I'm not sure if I should be here, if this is the right place for me. And he looked me in the eye and he said, let's, let's give it the night. Why don't you get some sleep tonight and see how you feel in the morning. And that's exactly what I did. I got a little sleep that night, not a lot, because I was so stressed. And the next day, I felt like, okay, I can give this another day, but I'm still just struggling with this anxiety. Got this panic inside all the time. And I stayed another day and another day. And for me, it turned into this, this journey of endurance. And... In my mind, it was, okay, Lord, I love you. I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I can make it, but I can give it one more day. And that one more day turned into one more week. And that week turned into another transfer. <laughs> 
and then after that, two transfers. And then after those two transfers, I was sent to my mission in Oklahoma City. And I was in Oklahoma City for about another year before the anxiety would hit me again. So bad and so intense that I had thoughts of hurting myself. And at this point, I ended up going home. After about 14 months on my mission, I went home. And let me tell you, it was worth every single minute because I learned just how far I could make it if I depended on the Lord. If I said, Lord, hey, I'll give it one more day if you help me through one more day. And I'm a totally different person because of this experience. And I wouldn't trade it for anything. And I'm in such a better place today and the Lord has blessed me in so many ways since. But it took years, it took years. It took eight years of my life to get to where I am today in my struggle with anxiety and depression. But I tell all of you who are thinking about serving missions, who wonder if this is right for me, to do it, to give it a try. Your mission presidents are there to help you. The Lord is there to help you. And you will learn to depend on him like no way you ever could. And to those of you that can't serve, and to those of you that, like me, have also come home early, you did your best. And in the Lord's eyes, that is the only thing that matters, is you gave it your all, and he will make up the rest. Maybe it's gonna take you a few years to work through things. Maybe it's gonna take longer than that. But the Lord will bless you. As Elder Holland also said, some blessings come soon, some come late, and some don't come till heaven. But those who believe in Jesus Christ, they come. And I testify that that is true because I have seen it in my life, even at times when I had to say, I'm struggling, I'm having a hard time. I don't know if I can make it. If I may be so bold, I have often compared my experience on a mission to the pioneers in the early Latter-day Church. Those who were in the Martin and Willie Hancock companies. And I wanna share a little bit about their experience. This is in a talk called The Refiner's Fire by James E. Faust. He relates, President McKay told of an occurrence that took place some years after the heroic exodus of Martin and Lily Hancock companies. A teacher conducting a class said it was unwise ever to attempt even to permit them, the Martin and Willie Hancock companies, to come across the plains under such conditions. According to a class member, some sharp criticism of the church and its leaders was being indulged in for permitting any company of converts to venture across the plains with no more supplies or protection than a handcart caravan afforded. An old man in the quarter sat silent and listened as long as he could stand it. Then he arose and said things that no person who heard them will ever forget. His face was white with emotion, yet he spoke calmly, deliberately, but with great earnest earnestness and sincerity. In substance, he said, I ask you to stop this criticism. You are discussing a matter you know nothing about. Cold historic facts mean nothing here, for they give no proper interpretation of the questions involved. Mistake to send the handcart company out so late in the season, yes, but I was in that company and my wife. 
We suffered beyond anything you can imagine, and many died of exposure and starvation. But did you ever hear a survivor of that company utter a word of criticism? Not one of that company ever apostatized or left the church because every one of us came through with the absolute knowledge that God lives, for we became acquainted with him in our extremities. I have pulled my hand cart when I was so weak and weary from illness and lack of food that I could hardly put one foot ahead of the other. I have looked ahead and seen a patch of sand or a hill slope and I have said I can only go that far and there I must give up for I cannot pull the load through it. I have gone onto that sand and when I reached it the cart began pushing me. I have looked back many times to see who was pushing my cart, but my eyes saw no one. I knew then that the angels of God were there. Was I sorry that I chose to come by hand cart? No. Neither then nor any moment of my life since. The price we paid to become acquainted with God was a privilege to pay. And I am thankful that I was privileged to come in the Martin hand cart company. I too feel like this early pioneer, where there were so many times with my mental health where I thought I can only make it this far and there I must give up for I cannot pull the load through. And so many times there was something that helped me pull that load through that when I got to that point, that I felt like I could just keep going, even though I thought I was gonna give up. Something helped me through, and I know it was the Lord, and I know it was angels, and I know it was my family on the other side of the veil. And for those that suffer and struggle, there is hope. There is a way to get through. Trust in God and believe in those good things to come for they will come even when you think all is lost. And so many times, all I had to hold on to from one minute to the next was a blessing, was my patriarchal blessing, was the scriptures, was words of the prophets, knowing that things would get better. And these experiences that I've had, I would trade for nothing because they make me who I am. And they taught me the love of my savior, even in the most difficult times, even when I fought days and days of thoughts of hurting myself because the anxiety was so intense and so overwhelming and unbeatable. But may the world know this, that I know that God lives and that his son Jesus Christ is real and that he suffered and died for you and for me so that we may learn from our mistakes, that we may grow and become better and eventually become like our Father in heaven. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ my savior, my help, my guide, my redemption. Amen.